Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. Our purpose is, in all activities to glorify God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Let's all stand and to God be the glory. Number 56. I hope all y'all can say the same thing. They are uh, good company and, and man of the man and woman of the Lord, and we uh, certainly appreciate them. And uh, last time I talked to them, they were almost at their destination over in Alabama to watch their grandson play football Thursday night. So uh, they uh, done well. Bert kept saying he uh, married up. Well, a lot of us men here did too, especially me. And uh, uh, today is our 51st wedding anniversary, so uh, we, uh, uh, we, <coughs> uh, I had a, uh, Joyce does a, does a real good job, cooks good, cleans house, keeps, keeps everything going, and, and I had a cousin down in Florida that said his wife was really a good housekeeper, and, uh, they got a divorce and she kept the house. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, we're I'm I'm proud of Joyce and our 51 years of uh, marriage and uh, 
with that, we'll uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings of life. Thank you for each and everything you do for us each year. Thank you for the 51 years we've had together, Father. We just uh, ask your blessings upon the years to come. We thank you for this church and every activity it undertakes to do, the outreach programs. We thank you for the opportunity to know folks like Bert and Jan and uh, be able to spend time with them this past week. Father, we ask that uh, you bless Brother Hahn as he comes this morning to fill the pulpit. We ask that he, you give him the words you'd have us to hear and to be with us. We ask our, your blessings upon the farmers as peanuts are beginning to be plowed up and cotton opening and being defoliated and ask for fair weather and that they may get the crops in and, and uh, as they're challenged to feed and clothe the world. Just be with uh, the sick, Father, that's uh, in the community and on our prayer list. Be with each one of them and feel their needs. Just uh, be with us to give us attentive ears and this morning and uh, give us, uh, we thank you for this holiday weekend, uh, the holiday for the work in America, the backbone of, of America, and this extra weekend break they we're having. Just uh, give us a good time with our family and friends. All this we ask in thy holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, Doyle, 50, yes. 51 years of marriage, did you give your wife another tractor? <laughs> no, you didn't give her another tractor? Okay. All right. I just didn't know where I needed to follow up on that. I drug one home yesterday, and she helped me drag it off the trailer, and she drug it all over the field. She was pretty stressed out, so I didn't know if you give her another antique tractor. So... <laughs> I'm just trying to follow in your footsteps. Okay. All right. The part I really enjoy, announcements. All right. Let's see how I can mess all this up, okay? And y'all supposed to shoot it up on there. There we go. And we got a blank screen. Christmas backpacks. Uh, there is an uh, example light yonder on the cart. Uh, drop it off. We're going to help the people in the mountains. Pictures. Picture. She has one picture. Now, that's for homecoming. Y'all please help on this. We don't need to see a picture of one person all during that, okay? All right. Y'all, if you got any, any, uh, any past members that have passed away or in your family, you want homecoming, please get Linda the pictures. There's a box out there in the foyer. There's a box in the foyer. They, they can give them to me or give them to Dale or there's a box right out there. Okay. I got you. All right. All right. Bring a bigger picture of your loved one, okay? All right. Mem uh, women's conference, September 17th. Kayla said she had how many signed up? Where are you at, Kayla? I've lost you. You, you always sit over here. You have thrown me off. Okay. 126. If you have somebody, please advertise this. Get it out there to get there to talk to people. I don't know Melissa's talked to people at, at, at school. She's going to get a lot of teachers up here. I've talked to people at work. Get with Kayla about a head count or, or Debbie or somebody. Anyway, big deal with the September 17th. Next Sunday, Three Bridges is coming and singing. They are part of the Gaffers. Y'all all turn out for that. That's a big deal for this church, this little church, for this group to come up here. Thank the goodness they're coming. We thank the, the one that's made this possible. Appreciate that. But they will be here next Sunday morning. So y'all all show up, please. And your Mayor Cantor is going to be here September 25th. Uh, he has preached here several times before. And welcome, y'all. Now, let me see. There will, there will also be a women's Bible study next, uh, next Sunday at 445. If you don't have a book, just show up women 445 next Sunday. Uh, da, 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 and that's it. Yes, Linda. You'll cut out the husband. No, and, uh, it's all right. 
Okay. Okay. But the wife's name won't be on there. Okay. All right. All right. Is anything else I messed up here? Yes, John. Oh, yes, I know, but go ahead. But deacons, we will be served. That's black tie and little hats. We're going to serve them ladies just as well as they served us at the men's conference. Also, we got work day next Sunday, next Saturday. Do you know, I know when it's going to start? Eight o'clock? Oh, this is good. We have work day next Saturday. Not the women's conference, but after that. We just got to get stuff cleaned up and, and done in the church. So uh, y'all just please show up at 8 o'clock. I don't want to be the only one here, okay? All right. We will, we will fine-tune that Wednesday night. All right. Now, is there anything else I forgot? All right. Off to our hymn, number 508. 508, let's all stand. vacation, pray for them as they return, give them a safe trip back, and pray for the rest of our church members that are traveling this uh, holiday weekend, just grant them all safe travels to bring them back home safe, Father. We thank you, Father, for this uh, past week of revival for the speakers that came and, and, and laid their hearts out and preached the word this week, Father. We just thank you for the, uh, the messages that we heard. We ask you, Father, for your Continued blessing upon this church and upon these tithes and offerings. Through your son Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.
Being after revival, and we had a super revival that door to mention. I mean, it was it was probably the best of everything. Thought I'd give the choir the day off. Of course, look, some of them took the day off, whether they're giving the day off or not. But anyway, uh, and I thought, what a quartet will sing. And then the phone rang last night, and I go, oh, no. Uh, Jennifer Band has COVID. So the lead singer, which is Josh, is at home making sure that he doesn't spread it. So I'm sort of like I'm the rookie uh, quarterback, and this is my running back and two receivers over here. So if I mess it up and lose the game, it's their fault. I'm the water boy. He's the water boy. (laughs) (laughs) We'd like to sing one that the the quartet sang for the uh, men's uh, convention or men's gathering or whatever we had last Saturday, what do you want to call it, on the Jericho Road. freaked out last night if Hans called me and said, oh, I won't be able to be here. <laughs> Thank goodness Hans is here. In his favor. The good part is I don't have Charlie's phone number. <clears throat> That's the way it needs to stay. Needs to stay. Those are those things I used to sit on when I was little. You were little? 
at one time. I usually wasn't quite, quite, quite uh, strong enough to actually sit up on my own, though. Hey, I'm glad you're here. It's, I, I don't know if you know this or not, it's, 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 it's Labor Day weekend, almost a Memorial Day. I get those two mixed up. Um, but it's Labor Day weekend, and glad you're here. I don't know if you're going to get an extra gold star in heaven because you work here, but I am glad you are here, okay? So, um, but I know it was pretty hard to get here this morning, and it may even be more difficult to get here tonight, but I'm going to ask you to try. And here's why I'm going to ask you to try, because I hardly go anywhere without somebody asking me, how's my son doing? And they're, who they're referring to is my son Silas here, who's on the front row. And tonight, he's going to talk about, he and I are going to talk about his cancer journey and how God has worked through all that uh, over the last few years. And so, uh, if you don't know, he's gone through uh, cancer treatments for two years, uh, two different times. And so, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And hopefully, it'll be an encouragement to you uh, this Labor Day weekend. Also, uh, please, big, large pictures, because I don't want to get the phone call. Hey, Hans, did you realize that you've got an entire church full of Bigfoot and Loch Ness monsters? You know, grainy pictures, you know, we don't want to do that. So let's go to, after that, we'll pray, we'll pray, ask the Lord to get this back on the rails. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all the folks that are here. Uh, thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, help us to put aside all the thoughts that are in our minds right now that are are clouding us from hearing what you have to say today. And Lord, to be able to focus in on you and your word. For it's in Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen and amen. Hey, did you know that Interstate 40 is the third longest road in the United States? Did you know that? Interstate 40. Third longest road. It runs from Barstow, California to Wilmington, North Carolina. Some 2,556.61 miles from one end to the other. Years ago, we uh, lived in South Carolina, and we would take trips to Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg. Anybody ever been to Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg? Okay, that's good. Well, when we would go, we would go on I-40 for a little bit uh, in the process of going. Now, you probably wouldn't go on I-40, but we did much. Maybe you go on it on the Knoxville side or Chattanooga side. Anyway, so... Our oldest son, Micaiah, who's not here this morning, he's off in seminary, uh, he had just started learning how to drive, or he was right on the edge of learning how to drive, and, and he knew the I-40, we'd been on it a number of times, and, uh, and so back in 2014, we flew out west, we flew out uh, west, and we were driving around Arizona, and when we got on to Interstate 40 in Arizona, I said to my son, uh, hey, this is the same I-40 that goes over by Gatlinburg. And he says, uh-uh. And I said, yeah, really, it's the same road. It goes all the way over to Gatlinburg. If you drive it, it goes all the way over that way. And he just didn't, didn't believe me. And I understand the road there in Arizona looks nothing like the road near Gatlinburg. Uh, but, and it wasn't what he was familiar with. We were several states, several time zones away. It seemed impossible but were it not for that handy interstate sign and an atlas. Now, for those of you who don't know, an atlas is a road map with, with a lot of road maps in it. Okay, that's, that's, that's what an atlas is. Uh, you may not have ever seen one, but if you need one, I'll show it to you. And so, and so he didn't realize that I-40 this long was this long. Well, here's the thing. I-40 hasn't always been that long. They just didn't just plop it down in the middle of the, of the interstate, I mean, in the middle of the, the United States, it's, it's been growing or had grown over decades. It expanded, and now it stretches from sea to shining sea, right? Well, tonight, this morning, we're going to take a, a journey through the Bible. And just like Interstate 40, we're going to go part by part. And it's going to start during the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. But that's just the first part of our journey, okay? So we're finding our first passage this morning in Numbers chapter 21. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 1, or 21, excuse me, Numbers chapter 21. I know you hear a lot of messages out of Numbers, right? Bruce preaches there all the time, Numbers. 
Some of you are like, I don't like math. Why are we in Numbers? Okay. Numbers chapter 21. And here we're going to find the Israelites are still wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because they did that for how many years? 40. 40 years they wandered the wilderness. And at this point, that's just a little bit longer than Doyle and Joyce have been married. Just a decade or so longer than, you know, that's, that's a long time. I would think, I mean, longer for her. He said it, not me. Okay. So they have yet, they've left Egypt. They've not yet entered the promised land. Aaron, the high priest, Moses' brother, has passed away. At this point, he's, he, he's, he's passed away. And he was the first of the leaders of the Israelites to do so. And so they're tired of the manna that the Lord has been providing every day. I mean, let's face it. If you ate the same thing every day, you might get a little tired of it too, right? And so they're taking the long way around Canaan, and they'd had enough, and they began to complain. Can you hear them? Are we there yet? That's what the Israelites are saying. Are we there yet? Why do we got to keep eating this bread off the ground? Are we there yet? Verse 4. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged along the way. Verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. The people were complaining, and the people were speaking out not just against Moses, but against God. They're saying, we're going to die. We hate this bread. You bless us with this bread every day, but we hate it. We're tired of it. We'd rather eat something else. We'd rather be slaves in Egypt then sons and daughters in the wilderness. And what do you think God thought of that? Well, he probably thought the same thing about it as you would think about your kids complaining what you made them for supper. I know that has never happened in any of your homes more than once, right? More than once. So we don't have to wonder what God thinks about it, though, because what does he do? He sends snakes. Snakes! He doesn't send scorpions. He doesn't send gnats. He doesn't send bed bugs. He sends snakes. And that, my friends, I don't know about these Israelites all those years ago, but that would have gotten my attention. Right? Snakes get my attention quick. Why? Because some of those things can kill you. And that's what happened here. The Israelites, were, they were being dramatic. They were saying, we're going to die because God doesn't care. All the while ignoring that God has been providing them bread and water and food and uh, clothes that didn't wear out. Ladies, shoes that didn't wear out for 40 years. Can you imagine that conversation? Saying to your husband, hey, I need to go buy another pair of shoes. Why? The ones on your feet look great. Right? Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Like, God has given them all these things that says, I am with you, I am caring for you. And they said, we don't care about any of that. We can't stand to be here any longer. So God allowed that to happen. He allowed the snakes to happen to some of them. And the people figured out that these snakes were in direct response to their complaints. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord, that he would take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Can you hear him? We are so sorry. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. Please ask God to take away the snakes. I would have been right there at the front of the line, y'all. That would have been, I would have been there. Again, putting myself in their sandals, I would have done the exact same things. And what did they say? Ask God to take away the snakes. What does he do? Verse 8, Then the Lord says to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks on it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was, if the serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. 
God didn't take away the snakes like the people wanted him to do. He didn't take away the snakes. The people wanted to be saved from this menace. They wanted to be saved from this plague of fiery serpents. And honestly, I don't blame them. But God had a different plan. See that? He didn't take the snakes away, but rather he made a way that once they had been bitten, they could be healed from the attack. But see, the snake on the stick is not necessary if they're not complaining. Catch that? The snake on the stick is not necessary if they're not complaining. If they're not saying, God, you don't care, when God is obviously showing them every single day that he cares. If the people hadn't sinned against the Lord and Moses, no snakes were necessary and no snake on a stick is necessary. The result was not a life without snakes, unfortunately. Life without fear, unfortunately. Life without being bit, unfortunately. Rather, the result was life after being bit. And here is the choice. Fall prey to the venom or rely on the way that God made. There was no cure. There was no antidote. Save looking at the snake on the stick. Either go the way that they wanted to go or go the way that he had made, either wither or worship. See this? The choice to look at the snake on the stick was a measure of faith. Faith that what God said he would do would work. Faith that the provision that the Lord had made would be sufficient to save. We too find ourselves desiring that God would take the results of our sin away. Y'all ever had that happen? You sin, you do something that you know the Lord didn't want you to do, and you pray, oh Lord, please take this from me. Take this away from me. I, I, I'm so sorry. I wish that I hadn't done that. Just take it away. And not only take, take the results of the sin away from me, but Lord, would you just, would you take away all sin from me? Would you take away even the temptation to sin from me? Have you ever prayed that to God before? I have. Oh, Lord, that I would be free to live now just like I will live when I've been made complete. That is, not only without sin, but also without a bent towards sinning. Even after the wilderness wanderings, the snake on a stick lives on in the lives of the Israelites. Once made, it remained as a part of their encampment through the rest of their wanderings until they made it to the promised land. And then once they get to the promised land, they set it up as an idol. Can you believe that? They start worshiping a snake on a stick. Have you ever heard of anything crazier than that? They called it Neshutin. We're not told what the worship of Neshutin looked like or the purpose of worshiping it. However, in my sanctified imagination, I imagine that I would go and take a sacrifice to this snake on a stick whenever I proverbially stepped in it. Whenever I made a really bad choice and I really didn't like the results. Like when the words that are in my brain come out of my mouth towards somebody that I love. I know none of y'all have ever had that happen before, but I'm just saying Or when they sinned in such an egregious way that they knew they would soon be judged. Or perhaps it was when somebody got sick for no apparent reason. And so they said, okay, we're going to, we're going to go give a sacrifice to this idol so that we can be healed. It worked in the past. Surely it would work now. So what was intended to point people to worship the Lord, the snake on a stick, becomes a thing that is worshipped. And at that point, it no longer points to the Lord, it points to a false God. And in 2 Kings chapter 18, good king Hezekiah, one of the few good kings of Israel, had it destroyed. And with that, it appeared the journey for this snake on a stick is over. That is, until Jesus. In the third chapter of John, that's our next stop on our journey across the Bible. So if you want to flip over there, John chapter 3. We find the visit of Nicodemus. 
coming to see Jesus at night. Nicodemus, a religious leader of the day, one of the Sanhedrin, coming to visit Jesus at night. And during that conversation, Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. He clarifies and says, unless someone is born of water and spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, as you read this passage, he's very, he, he's distraught by this. He doesn't understand what Jesus is trying to say. He can't get past the mechanics of it all. And then in the midst of this chapter is one of the most beloved verses in all the Bible. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But you know that verse doesn't exist by itself. There's a context. Jesus said things before that. He said things after that. And they're all important. And it just so happens that Jesus brings up this serpent starting in verse 14. John 3.14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent... In the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so when Jesus says in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he's talking about this snake on a stick. He's talking about this bronze serpent found in Numbers 21. And he's talking about it in the original sense, not as it became an idol, but what it was used for in the beginning. Look again at verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, must the Son of Man even... Must the Son, even so of man, be lifted up? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. As a religious leader, Nicodemus would have known about this moment in Jewish history. As a religious leader, he would have got the reference. Y'all ever, y'all ever do this? Y'all ever quote a TV show or a movie around a group of people expecting them to know what you're talking about? And then sometimes you get a bunch of blank looks and then sometimes you get some, some snickers. No, not the candy bar, but just some laughs. I love quoting movies, right? And so Jesus is quoting this moment, knowing that Nicodemus, as a member of the Pharisees, would have known what he was talking about. He didn't have to go into the whole history. He didn't have to say, do you remember back in Numbers? Do you remember in the Torah? He didn't have to do any of that. All he had to do was say this little thing to Nicodemus, and he would know... The reference. And Nicodemus would have known this was a life or death moment. That Jesus wasn't just talking about a fable or a parable, but that he was, or some nice teaching, but rather Jesus is connecting the born again statement with the life and death statement. And the implication is there will come a time when the Son of Man, Jesus, will be lifted up for a similar purpose as the snake on the stick, as the bronze serpent in the wilderness. Verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, the snake was a symbol of judgment. You ever drive past a prison and look at that prison and think to yourself, there are people that are incarcerated there. There are people who wake up in the morning and they're behind bars and they go to sleep at night and they're behind bars. And sometimes prisons are kind of like available for us to see. They're, They're not tucked away in the deepest reaches of a county typically. More often than not, they're somewhere where people can drive by them. Maybe even sometimes drive by them with regularity. Why? Because we're a nation of laws. 
And we want people to know that if you break the laws, there will be consequences. Now, I know we can talk about a whole lot of politics and how that all is going through the rest of the United States. But generally speaking, that's what I'm talking about. You see, it was a reminder about this plague. The snake on a stick was a reminder about this plague upon the Israelites. And there was no need to look upon that snake unless you had been bitten. People didn't wake up in the morning having not been bitten going, now where's the snake today? Where's it at? Right? The only reason you need to look at that snake is if you got, I mean, look at the snake on a stick is if you got bitten by a snake. Perhaps there were those who wandered in the wilderness who were bitten by one of these snakes and yet they thought it was something else. Y'all ever get bitten by something and think to yourself, oh, it's just a this or it's just a that. And it turns out to be something much worse than that or something better than that. Whatever. So maybe they got bit and they thought, oh, it was just a bug bite or or that was a lizard or that was a scorpion or something. But then as the venom begins working its way up their leg and they can feel it coming up their leg and the pain and the agony of this fiery venom coming up their leg, maybe into their calf, maybe all the way up to their knee, they know that they're being judged. But maybe they didn't want to admit it. Maybe they didn't want to see themselves as a complainer, someone who had cursed God. Maybe they thought to themselves, surely I have not complained as bad as Hiram, that guy in the next tent over. So there's no way I've been judged because he hasn't been judged. There were others, certainly, that are worse than me. But then as the pain begins to move into the thigh and would rather uh, and, and would soon come into their heart and kill them, The question then becomes, would I rather turn and face the bronze serpent on the stick or would I rather die in me being convinced that I am not a sinner, that I have not gone against the Lord? And so they swallow their pride, step out, look up, scan the horizon for that snake that bronze serpent on a stick. And then they're healed. Because the choice to look at the snake on the stick was a measure of faith. Faith that the provision of the Lord had made would be sufficient to save. Now, in case you hadn't figured it out, when Jesus said he would be lifted up, he's talking about the cross. We believe he's talking about the cross. He's foreshadowing the cross. The cross, too, is a symbol of judgment. People were not put on crosses for no good reason except Jesus. But even there, there was a good reason to save us. Right? It was a public, prolonged, painful execution with the intent of warning other people not to do the same sorts of things that these folks did. People who die on a cross typically die to suffocation because as they're trying to lift themselves up in order to be able to breathe, that diaphragm, their diaphragm was compressed, and so in order to try to lift themselves up in order to be able to breathe, they just they lost the strength in their arms, and they just couldn't fill their air, fill their lungs with air. But listen, the cross of Christ is not necessary if we don't sin. And you don't have to look at the cross of Christ if you never sin. But the fact of the matter is, and the Bible declares, and we know this to be true, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We could pray all day, not only that we would live a sinless life, but not even be tempted to sin, and yet that wasn't the Lord's plan. And so we beg him, and we ask him, like the Israelites, to take away the snakes, take away the sin, take away these thoughts in my head, take away these plans that I have, take away all these things. And and instead of doing that, God makes a way. He could have just let us go. Only to be dead in our sin. Only to be bit by sin, which leads to death. He didn't have to make a way, but he did. Why? Verses 16 and 17 tell us, For God so, what? Loved the world. 
that he gave his only begotten son. I'm going to be honest with you. I like y'all a lot, but I ain't giving any of my kids for you. And you probably think, well, that's good, Hans, because I ain't giving any of mine for you either. And that's cool. Like, I, we could have this mutual agreement. But God so loved not only the Israelites that were living in first century Palestine, but also us here in America today and all the generations past and all the generations future. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, I wonder how many in this world today get bitten by sin and think, well, it's just a scratch. It's just a flesh wound. It's just a bug bite. There's no big deal. But then it starts working its way into our heart and we begin to feel it in our body and we begin to see it in our mind and it begins to take a toll and we know that if we don't do something soon, we're going to enter an eternity without Christ. And so we look up and we scan the horizon just like those Israelites did all those years ago and we find not a serpent on a pole, but the cross and a Savior dying on the cross faith that the provision that the Lord had made would be sufficient to save is what drives us to look to him. Our final stop on our journey through the Bible this morning is Romans chapter 7. Again, I encourage you to flip over there with me, Romans 7. Paul's just concluded chapter 6 by saying the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. By the way, what a terrible paycheck, right? Wages is what we earn when we do something. And earning death, not the kind of paycheck I'm looking for. How about you? I'm not. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, examine something else that was intended to help people to worship the Lord and to become something more than what God intended, the law. Not just the law as in like a law enforcement officer or the speed limit or you need to pay your taxes, but the law of God and its ability to save us in relationship to the law of sin. Romans 7, 13 and following says this. Paul's wrestling. I want you to see this, folks. I want you to hear this. I want you, this is a guy who from the earliest ages was raised up in a believing home, a home that believed in Yahweh, a home that believed in the Lord. From the earliest days, he's been studying the scripture. He knows it forwards and backwards, mostly backwards, because that's how Hebrews read, right? Backwards. You'll get that later. All right, and so, but he, he knew the scripture, and, and, and yet he struggled with his own sin. This guy wrote over half the New Testament. He is the super saint. And here's Paul. Has then what is good, what he's talking about here is the law, the law of God. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through, through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I'm sold under sin. Verse 15. For what I am doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. I call this the do-do passage. What I want to do, I don't do, and what I do want to do, I don't do. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find that a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm glad he didn't stop there. Verse 25. I Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Just like the snakes called out Israel's sin, just like the cross calls out our sin, the law of God calls out our sin as well. It forces us to realize that we have fallen short. It forces us to realize that we have failed to be as perfect as God. But like an x-ray, you ever go and get an x-ray or you know people that have gotten x-rays, what do they do? They, they, they put the, the affected body part on this table and they scan it and they're able to see below the skin what's going on. Is there cancer there? Is there, is there a broken bone there? What's, what's going on? But it doesn't cure anything. It just diagnoses the problem. It's a tool. It doesn't mend. It doesn't cure. It simply shows us what's wrong. And that's what the law is like. And no matter how hard we want not to sin, and no matter how hard we desire, or how much we pray, or how much people go to do that, and we, we go to other people, we ask them to pray on our behalf, our brokenness is still there. We still wrestle with the law of sin, and we still wrestle with the law of God. Until our last day, we will wrestle with these things. But just like God intended the snake and the law, the cross points us to worship the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just like those Israelites who looked upon the snake and didn't perish because of the venom, we too have a savior that when sin bites us, the injury does not have to result in our death. The deliverance is from belief in him. Jesus, who finished his work on the cross of Calvary so we could be saved. So what about you this morning? What about you? Have you been bitten by sin? And you know you've been trying to deny that it happened, but you know Today, will you step out? Will you scan the horizon and look up and find the cross of Christ and ask him to forgive you? If you don't know Jesus this morning, I would love to tell you about him even more than I've already told you about him. Because listen, he's the only one who gets us to heaven. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's, it's not, there's only one way. If you've ever been to Pigeon Forge in that area, there's this place called Cades Cove. And it's a big loop. And it's one way. You only go in one way and you only come out one way. There's no extra roads there. Friends, there's only one way to heaven. And it's through Jesus Christ and his cross. Maybe this morning, Christian, you've been, you've been running from the Lord. You've been trying to say, well, I've accepted Christ, and so I've got my ticket, but I, I've got this thing going on in my life, and I really like it, and it's really not hurting me, so I'm just going to keep on doing it. You don't feel the venom coming up your leg. It's on its way to your heart. Maybe this morning you need to come and confess that to the Lord. Not necessarily to me, but at this altar or during this time of invitation. Confess that to the Lord. Maybe this morning as we worship the Lord, you know this is where God is calling you to serve him. At Antioch Baptist Church, Charlie will be here, others will be here. They can tell you how to become a member of Antioch Baptist Church. Or maybe this morning God is working in your heart and calling you to go. Not only past these walls not only past the borders of Worth County, but into all the world and share the... That he's calling you into ministry. I would love the opportunity to talk with you about that. As your director of missions, it brings me so much joy to see God raising up young people and old people and and middle-aged people and all sorts of people 
to share the cross of Christ throughout a lost and dying world because everybody needs to be able to step out and look up and see the cross and receive him. Everybody needs to have that opportunity. And yet there are over 3 billion people in the world that have little to no opportunity to do that today. And if we don't go, who will? Who will? So as Charlie and the instrumentalists come, we're going to have a time of invitation. It's just a time for you to respond. What does that look like? Well, if you would like to know more about Jesus, I would love to tell you about it. Come and talk to me. Grab my hand. We will talk about Jesus. And we'll spend even more time talking about Jesus this morning. Or maybe you need to come and pray at this altar about something the Lord is doing in your life. Or maybe you want to talk to me about missions or ministry. Love to talk with you about that. And if you want to talk about joining Antioch Baptist Church, I know that there's someone here who can talk to you about that as well. But in a moment, we're going to sing, we're going to stand, we're going to pray. And we're going to give this time over to the Lord. And then you respond as God leads you, okay? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for everyone that's here this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've made a way. I thank you that in the wilderness, you, you prepared our hearts to have the desire to look up and to find salvation. And because of who Jesus did and the work that he did on the cross, we can look up and find salvation. And today I pray... I ask, I humbly beg, Lord, I would love for you to take away the snakes. I would love for you to take away the sin. I would love for you to take away the temptation. And God, any of that you want to do, Lord, I pray that you would do that. But if not, help us never to forget to look up to you, to put our faith and our trust in what you have done for your honor and for your glory. Now, Lord, in this time of invitation, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to follow you. For it's in Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen.